Um, so it's uh, time to start. Um, so maybe there will um, go slow to allow people to, to come in. Um, I'm, I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Um, so uh, my name is Rory Edmonds, uh, and I'm the uh, program officer of the ICSU World Data System. Uh, before we get started, uh, please just allow me to give you a, a few admin uh, details. So we usually time these webinars to last for about uh, 45 minutes in total, which includes 15 minutes uh, at the end for questions. However, um, hopefully you'll have uh, noticed we've actually got uh, a few speakers tonight. Um, so we hope you don't mind if we potentially extend this a little bit longer, maybe another five minutes or so, just to allow for some swapping and, uh, and so on. Um, and again, uh, owing to the large number of speakers, uh, it's been decided not to use the webcams tonight. Um, you'll, of course, uh, still be able to see the slides. I hope you can see the welcome slide that we have up at the moment. And of course, you'll hear the presentations. And we're also recording this. Uh, so we will make sure that the video and slides are available as soon as possible afterwards. And uh, hopefully, we can uh, easily notify you of that through the system. Um, so again, you've probably realized, uh, those of you who are joining us for the first time, that you can hear us. And, and again, I hope you can hear me but we cannot hear you. Uh, this decision was taken to avoid bandwidth issues. Uh, however, if you press the buttons up on the, the top right of your screen, you'll see several panels. Uh, if you use the chat window uh, to contact me, uh, I'm the host. Uh, it unfortunately comes up as Mustafa McCrane. Uh, we only have one account, so, uh, but uh, if you co contact host, you can t uh, tell me of any technical issues you have. Um, and you'll also see that we have uh, a Q&A window. And if at any time during the, the webinar you, could, you have a, a question you'd like to think about at the end uh, uh, to be answered, then uh, of course, please add your question there. And we will go through them one by one and hope that we can get through them all. Um, otherwise, we'll see if we can uh, answer them by email afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, offer you all a warm welcome. Uh, thank you for, for joining this, the 11th WDS webinar, uh, entitled, Are You Far Web Resources? Simplifying Complexity for Medicine and Education. And this will be the first in what we hope will be a short series of webinars uh, concerned with health-related data. And such data have become increasingly of interest to WDS, uh, mainly due to the fact that for many years, the large financial investment um, has, has meant uh, that the health sciences have not often or always shared their data. Uh, there's now big movements afoot that are changing this, and especially saw, we saw with the uh, Ebola outbreak not so long ago, uh, the speed at which solutions can be found when data are shared in the health sciences. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's my pleasure today to welcome a number of speakers from IUFAR, which is the International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology. And they'll be talking about their web-based services and how these enable the simplification and dissemination of highly complex data sets. Uh, moreover, it's being used as a model to help raise funds uh, for the ongoing curation of these data. Uh, the webinar is broken down into six parts, uh, the first of which is named IUFAR Overview and Strategy, and that will be given by the IUFAR Secretary General, Michael Spedding. So uh, let me make you presenter, and uh, it will be over to you, Michael. Okay. Thank you very much, Rory. So I'm Secretary General of the National Union of Pharmacology, and I want to present how we're trying to simplify complexity uh, and disseminate uh, knowledge via, web, via our set of websites. We've got a series of speakers who will be introduced uh, one after another as they, as they come on board. Um, I am just going to give a little overview and strategy of what IUFAR does. It's the International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology, 
and represents 36,000 scientists around the world who are pharma from the different pharmacological societies. And I want to point out that we're trying to address some major crises in healthcare. Pharmacology is a science of how drugs, and drugs can be either small molecules, natural products, antibodies, vaccines, how they work, how they can be discovered, and also how they can be used correctly. That's crucial for healthcare. Now, at the present moment, the world's facing a variety of crises, and one of the first is just the two different worlds of rich and poor, high income and low income, and this is global deaths as um, from WHO data from high and low income. In blue is non-communicable diseases, red is communicable diseases and greener injuries. And the depth of color indicates the way in which the diseases are progressing with bigger color, darker color meaning a more rapid progression. And we can see a completely different um, panoply of, of causes of death from ischemic heart disease in blue in the left uh, to the massive amount of HIV and TB in low income and particularly developing world. Sometimes those deaths are also due to policy decisions which could have been corrected. And um, the, also the other thing is that um, this challenge in healthcare is also associated with another crisis, which is a crisis of innovation. Uh, Alzheimer's is clearly progressing in the high income world and we don't have effective um, drugs for Alzheimer's. There's also another crisis, which is the crisis of complexity, because now we know matters more than we did 40 years ago, yet my, um, invest, my uh, PhD supervisor for in, in, from industry, a guy called Roy Britton, discovered drugs with a total value of 670 billion pounds for asthma and for heart disease. And uh, this was when we knew nothing about what we know today. And it's a real challenge for young scientists to come on board and faced with the complexity of antibodies, of, of alternative splicing, non-coding RNAs, when some of these variables can be eliminated with good experiments. And so we try and diffuse simple messages which are expert-based. The other crisis is in reproducibility, and whereby we've also got actions in terms of being able to support further reproducibility. So how do we go about to do this? Well, we're, we're our, um, we've got united the pharmacology societies around the world, and we've got a big action now at present on Africa, include uh, with FARFA, Pharmacology for Africa. And so what we try and do is to use experts, and also we have got specific sections within our UFAR, a clinical division, and also a preclinical groups, and central to this it's a committee we're going to talk a bit more about, which is in the database of, uh, for drugs, the Committee of Receptor Nomenclature and Drug Classification, which has actually grown over the last 25 years to have six, sorry, 90 subcommittees and 700 scientists contributing freely to human knowledge. So we've got pharmacology of natural products, um, helping academic drug, drug discovery, etc. And one of the things that we are involved in there's also some relevant WHO priorities where our UFAR is very active to promote drug discovery R&D with open source knowledge databases and compound libraries. And that's one of the things that we do. Early stage drug discovery, global cooperation, um, natural products, which we've got sections on, and clinical trials and regulatory affairs. So we're active in there. We're also very active in education, as you'll hear in a, in a few minutes. And uh, we also do courses, on-hand courses as well, but they're always backed up with web-based web activities. And we've very also put a lot of effort into dissemination via newsletters, email alerts, etc. So you can join our activities on, on, on social media. Uh, we've got a great collaboration with the British Pharmacological Society, and uh, they've helped us to give a long-term investment into the database for drug targets, which we're going to talk about and the Guide to Pharmacology in a paper version, the Concise Guide to Pharmacology. And we've also got a major investment in immunopharmacology with the Immufar group, which Francesca Levy Schaefer is chair of, with 60 members. And we'd like to thank Welcome for Immunopharmacology Grant. I just want to point out, before we go into the details of it, that the drug targets, we have very many drug targets, but for which immune disease? And it, the, the, the investment of taking a drug into the clinic is immensely 
expensive one. So for which targets? Well, we believe that experts can actually solve this much easier than data crawl crawling through the uh, web. And so what we've got is uh, a series of um, committees, et cetera, whereby we can help industry choose which targets based on current knowledge using validated targets. And one of the key issues is that we use is that by using targets, drug targets which have been reproduced, that is more than two publications or, or two publications, we can then use that as something which is much more solid than the latest paper, perhaps in a very high profile journal. So we try and simplify complexity with pharmacology using expert subcommittees who will validate our databases. And the main database that we have at present, uh, the key one, which is we've grown up, is the Guide to Pharmacology Database about drug targets. And um, Adam Porson uh, and Steve Alexander are going to be talking about this now. So thank you. I'll pass the ball now to you. Uh, okay, and as Michael has, has said, um, that our next speaker today is uh, Adam Porson, who's the Guide to Pharmacology Senior Database Curator, um, and he'll be talking about NCIUFAR, the Guide to Pharmacology Database and Concise Guide. So um, please, Adam, uh, uh, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Rory. Uh, so, as Michael mentioned, NCIUFAR is the IUFAR Committee on Receptor Nomenclature and Drug Classification. And um, NCIUFAR has a number of objectives, um, some of which include issuing guidelines for the nomenclature and classification of human biological targets, uh, facilitating the designation of newly discovered sequences as functional biological targets and potential drug targets, designating the polymorphisms and variants which are functionally important and then also developing an authoritative and freely available global online resource, the IUFAR BPS Guide to Pharmacology Database. Uh, now, NTIUFAR has also had long-standing relationships with both the American and British pharmacological societies, that's ASPET and the BPS, and this is <clears throat> mainly for the publication of official IUFAR nomenclature reports in pharmacological reviews, and state-of-the-field uh, review articles, uh, IUFAR review articles and editorials in the British Journal of Pharmacology. And these articles are published both by members of NCIUFAR and also the NCIUFAR expert subcommittees. And uh, they tend to be very highly cited. The cumulative H index for all NCIUFAR commissioned review articles is currently 79. Um, and, and if you look at uh, this uh, citation report taken from the Web of Science <clears throat> up at the top right there, you can see that since the first publication of uh, an NCIUFAR nomenclature report in 1994, um, uh, NCIUFAR commissioned articles have received some 34,700 citations. And the highest cited uh, nomenclature report is that of the 5-hydroxytryptamine um, uh, um, a nomenclature report which has received 2,500 um, uh, citations. So um, a number of uh, recent areas that NCIUFAR has become interested in include the immunopharmacology, therapeutic antibodies and, um, and kinases, and uh, a bit later in the webinar, Simon Harding will be talking about the UFAR uh, uh, Guide to Immunopharmacology project. It's a new project that we've initiated. NCIUFAR also has a very productive collaboration with Orphanet. Um, other areas include proteases and hydrolases, epigenetic targets, natural products, um, allosteri and uh, alternative splicing, for which official IUFAR uh, publications have been produced, and then also academic drug discovery. So in terms of the actual committee, NCIUFAR uh, has a core committee made up of the executive committee, and the core members who are drawn from both academia and industry. Um, NCIUFAR is chaired by Stephen Alexander, who's on this call. Um, Steve took over from Michael Spinning a few years ago. There are also on the right there a number of um, ex officio members, including the IUFAR president and secretary general and treasurer, uh, members of the database team, a representative from the Human Genome uh, Nomenclature Committee, and then also the editor-in-chief from the British Journal of Pharmacology. And then down at the bottom there is also the Clinical Translational Pharmacology Group, which uh, includes Sir Colin Dollery, who founded NCIUFAR in 1987. 
So, um, in addition to uh, weekly teleconferences, members of NCIU um, meet in person twice a year in the spring and the, and the autumn uh, to discuss future directions of NCIU FAR and also the development of the uh, Guide to Pharmacology database. So um, the committee also includes a number of corresponding members, again also drawn from ac academia and industry, and the corresponding members increase the global representation of NCIU FAR. And uh, our corresponding members um, are often invited to our meetings, uh, and this would be dependent on the focus of the particular meetings. And then, of course, there's the NCIU FAR subcommittees. And the subcommittees are really uh, the people that do all the, the really hard work, and, and we're very grateful for that. We have over 90 subcommittees uh, comprising um, approximately 850 scientists worldwide. And um, each subcommittee um, has a chairperson, and each subcommittee deals with a, a particular family of biological targets or a specific area. And these subcommittees feed data, feed data and information back to NCIU FAR, um, along with recommendations, and also to the database team for inclusion of data in the database. And uh, obviously, then also publish NCIU FAR commission reviews. And the size of these subcommittees can vary from 15 members down to two members, depending on how rapidly a particular field is advancing. So now on to the um, actual Guide to Pharmacology database. So the database um, aims to provide access to data on all known human biological targets, uh, to make recommendations on tool ligands for use, uh, for use in characterizing these targets, uh, providing an entry point to the pharmacological literature, an integrated educational resource, and then ultimately fostering uh, innovative drug discovery. And as I mentioned, the database is, uh, development is overseen by NCIU for. Um, so the database itself is developed at the University of Edinburgh by a team of uh, developers and curators under the leadership of Professor Jamie Davies. Um, it's developed under the auspices of IUFAR and the British Pharmacological Society with funding from the British Pharmacological Society and the Wellcome Trust, and our meetings are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust and Servier. Um, so in terms of database content, uh, we, uh, on average, uh, have four uh, public database releases every year, the most recent uh, on the 26th of January, version 2017.1. And in terms of target content, um, we have over 2,700 established and potential drug targets and related proteins annotated in the database. This includes all the non-sensory GPCRs, ligand and voltage-gated ion channels, all the nuclear hormone receptors, and then enzymes, including catalytic receptors, kinases, proteases, all the transporters, and then a category of other protein targets. Um, in terms of ligand content, uh, we have over 8,700 ligands, drugs, and antibodies annotated in the database, including all approved drugs, uh, synthetic organic compounds, metabolites, hormones, neurotransmitters, natural products, peptides, both endogenous and synthetically modified, uh, so therapeutic antibodies and then labeled ligands, be it radioactive, fluorescent, or PET uh, ligands. And very shortly, uh, Joanna Sharman, our senior developer, will tell us um, how the targets and ligands are presented in the database. Um, but finally, I just want to briefly mention the concise guide to pharmacology. So um, once every two years, we take a, take a snapshot of all the um, target family summaries in the database. And we published this uh, in collaboration with the BPS as a supplement uh, to the British Journal of Pharmacology as a series of PDF files that are intended to be a quick desktop reference guide. So as well as listing the key properties of targets along with tool compounds for characterizing these targets, very usefully these PDF files also have embedded hyperlinks in them. So for example, gene names and Uniprot IDs um, hyperlink directly to the corresponding entries in HGNC and UniProt. Um, target and ligand names within the PDF files link directly to the entry in the online database. And PubMed IDs link directly to the online citations of PubMed. And this publication is available free to download at that URL there. Um, and uh, this is the very striking cover of the Concise Guide to Pharmacology. And this is an example of a typical page, target family page in the concise guide. In this case, the histamine receptors, 
there's a, an overview which highlights the nomenclature report for this particular family of targets. And the four receptors are listed in a table alongside each other um, with their official nomenclature links to the um, uh, gene database and UNIPROT, principal transduction, and then selective agonist, antagonist, and radioligands. And as I mentioned, all the information in the table is hyperlinked to those various resources. Uh, there's also a comments section on uh, commenting on data in the table, and then uh, very usefully also a list of further reading references um, uh, for uh, users to consult. So um, now I'll hand over to Joanna Sharman. Okay, so thank you very much, Adam. Uh, so as Adam mentioned, uh, we're going to move on to database deve developmental aspects. Um, and Joanna Sharman is going to talk about this, who's the Guide to Pharmacology Senior, da senior Database Developer. So um, please, uh, Joanna, uh, can, can continue as you're, when you're ready. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yep, so I'm the database developer, and in this talk, I'm going to guide you through the organization um, and the main features on the Guide to Pharmacology website. And then I'm briefly going to talk about some of the other resources that we are involved in developing. So this is the um, Guide to Pharmacology database homepage. At the top is a quick search bar where you can type in a keyword and do a search across the whole database. Uh, below that is the main menu bar from which you can get to all the different resources that I'm going to describe. Um, the top uh, left and middle panels are quick links into the targets and ligands sections of the database. And below that are announcements about new content and NCIUFAR news, including a latest NCIUFAR review articles and hot topics in pharmacology. So I'm going to move straight on to the target section, which you can access via that, um, those links on the top left. This is the, uh, on, on the left-hand side is a screenshot of the target landing page divided up by target class, for example, iron channels. If you click on the link, you get to a list of the iron channel families arranged as a tree with subfamilies. Um, clicking on a family name takes you to the family summary page, shown there in the top right image. Uh, the, the family summary includes an overview describing the family, which is in many cases linked to a more detailed introductory article written by NCIU FAR subcommittees. Uh, it includes um, the members of the family or subfamilies if that's the case, also further reading and the names of the NCIUFAR subcommittee. For each target member of the family, um, it includes a summary of the nomenclature, the genetic information in human, mouse and rat, and the key experimental ligands and approved drugs that bind to that target. Now for many of the targets, um, there's also a link to a more detailed data page and that includes a lot of different types of information, including functional data, um, tissue distribution, uh, diseases, and of course, lots of pharmacology. For example, um, long tables uh, of ligands, such as antagonists, as shown in the bottom right image. So I'm going to move on to ligands now. For ligands. Uh, you can access them in a very similar way to targets. You um, will land on the ligand list, as shown in the left here. Uh, this is divided up by ligand class, um, and also includes a list of all the approved drugs in the database. If you click on a ligand name, it takes you to the ligand summary page, and this includes a lot of uh, nomenclature information, uh, links to other databases, uh, biological activity, and clinical use data for approved drugs. It also includes uh, structural data and physicochemical properties. Each of these ligand structure images uh, is clickable, and if you click on it, you go to the chemical structure search tool, as shown in the bottom image here. You can edit a chemical structure or paste it in, and then you can perform a structure-based search on the database to find similar ligands. So uh, that ends the brief tour of the database uh, website. Um, and on this slide, uh, it's just going to uh, go over the organization of the 
whole site, including the other resources. So the website itself is freely available at www.guidefarmcology.org. And if you go onto the site and click on the resources tab on the main menu, you can find uh, the other resources I'm going to describe. Just going around from the top clockwise, this includes um, downloadable CSV files of data from the current version. Um, also, we provide full SQL dump files of the underlying database if anyone wants to get hold of the raw data. Um, we've recently developed web services that serve up uh, data in the computationally readable JSON format. Uh, the site also includes detailed help pages and uh, tutorials. There are also generic slide sets and posters, which can be edited and used for teaching and demoing the site. Uh, another recent project um, is the uh, collaboration with Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh to develop a RDF format for the interaction data. Uh, this is in progress um, and is important because it's a standard format for data exchange online and will allow the Guide to Pharmacology data to be easily incorporated into other resources, for example, the Open Facts project on linked pharmacology data. Uh, another major project that's ongoing is the Guide to Immunopharmacology, which um, Simon is going to talk about in a moment. And then also, we've been heavily involved in producing the Concise Guide to Pharmacology, which Adam has already discussed. And this is produced via automated extraction of sections of the target family summaries um, into a publication-ready format. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll hand over to Simon. OK, so um, as uh, Joanna mentioned, our next speaker uh, is uh, Simon Harding, uh, who's going to be talking about the new guide to immunopharmacology database initiative. Um, and he's the uh, database developer for that uh, particular database. So uh, Simon, please, uh, over to you. OK, thanks, Rory, and, and thanks, Joe, um, for giving the background to the guide to pharmacology. Um, I'm going to quite briefly, just in a couple of slides, present to you this new resource that's um, under development, which is the IUFAR Guide to Immunopharmacology. Um, many diseases have, or depend strongly on, an immune or an inflammatory component. Therefore, the development of drugs to modulate these components has great value and would benefit immensely from improved data exchange between pharmacology and immunology experts. Our Wellcome Trust funded resource is being developed to meet this need and is designed as an extension to the existing IUFAR BPS Guide to Pharmacology. Like the Guide to Pharmacology, the Guide to Immunopharmacology will be an open access and regularly updated resource. A new portal will provide a unique access point to the immunological data that will be friendly to both immunologists and pharmacologists alike. And the new portal will be integrated into the main Guide to Pharmacology website, enhancing search mechanisms and providing new ways to browse and visualize the data. The screenshot shown here shows an early alpha version of the new portal, but as you can see, it is uh, it's in keeping with the style of the Guide to Pharmacology database. And um, I would also like to mention that I've been um, preparing uh, regular technical blogs uh, on the progress, development progress of the Guide to Community Pharmacology, which are available at the URL at the foot of this slide. In terms of the data, the existing database will be enriched by tagging targets and ligands of immunological relevance and linking them to new data types, such as processes, cell types, and disease. For these new data types, we are making use of existing ontologies to provide controlled vocabularies against which we can annotate data, and therefore associate or link targets and ligands with specific processes, pathways, cell types, and disease. In the case of process data, we are using the gene ontology, or GO, specifically their biological process ontology. For cell types, we are using the cell ontology. And for diseases, the disease ontology, as well as resources at OMIM and Orphanet. Uh, the URLs for these main um, ontologies are shown at the bottom of the slide. Using ontologies in this way enables better interoperability between our data and other resources, and helps to ensure we are using common, well-understood terminology. The new data in the Guide to Immunopharmacology will be annotated and curated by subcommittees at NCIUFAR, as Adam has already explained, um, particularly ones with expertise 
in immunity, inflammation, and kinase biology. Um, so our first public beta release um, that you'll be able to get your hands on will should be available in spring 2017, and we're currently looking likely as early May. Um, as this resource is under development, we welcome those interested and potential future users to engage with us and discuss, and discuss additional features and or data that this new resource might provide. Um, so yeah, that was very brief. Thank you for listening. Um, and I will uh, pass on to our next speaker. So thank you very much uh, to Simon for, the, for that uh, brief uh, introduction to the uh, immunopharmacology database. Um, we now move to the uh, IU Phar Pharmacology Education Project, PEP. Um, and the co-lead of, of the, the PEP project is uh, John Sarzak, and he's uh, here to, uh, to explain more about it to you. So please take it away, John. Thank you, Rory. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you today from Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in the United States. Uh, we're excited to be sharing this, another new uh, project of IUFAR. Uh, with you today and summarizing our work up to this point in developing the site and also asking you to become engaged in the project. The website's being developed by IUFAR uh, and we've received initial support from uh, ASPED, which was mentioned earlier, the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. The PEP is a repository of learning resources to support education and training in pharmacological sciences. The materials are valuable to students of pharmacology, clinical pharmacology, and anyone who's looking to develop a stronger grasp of the pharmacological sciences. The site is a simple, attractive, easily searchable resource that will support students of the biomedical sciences and health sciences, including, uh, for example, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy, as well as those of us who teach them. It is also intended that it will set in context and act as a stepping stone towards some of the cutting edge data curated within the IUFAR Guide to Pharmacology, which we've heard about, and allow those who are less familiar with such material to have some understanding. The fundamental organization of the PEP is its editorial board, which is composed of leaders in pharmacology education across the world. And the countries are represented in this slide that's shown. The members of the editorial board advise and support the co-leaders of IUFAR PEP. Each board member is responsible for a topic area in pharmacology, which facilitates their role in providing input on content needs, suggesting potential authors, and reviewing submissions. Value for our PEP leaderships includes the co-leaders and the curator. I am, in addition to uh, me, uh, Professor Simon Maxwell from the University of Edinburgh is a, a co-leader of the PEP, and Dr. Elena Facenda, also from the University of Edinburgh, is our co-curator. Uh, uh, we are the ones who are accountable for the quality of the content and are responsible for identifying important areas in need of content, handling day-to-day -day maintenance of the site, and organizing the flow of submissions. This slide and the next slide will show uh, some of the organization of the PEP website. Uh, this is a screenshot uh, from one of the pages. Uh, through an agreement with the University of Edinburgh and IUFAR, the PEP website is hosted by the University of Edinburgh and maintained by the Guide to Pharmacology Project Management Team. The site was built by the University of Edinburgh using Drupal. The website's organized around four main sections, as you can see at the top there, pharmacology, clinical pharmacology, drugs, and therapeutics. Under each section are a series of modules, and these are shown on the, right, the left-hand side, for example, for the section pharmacology. And under this section, for instance, includes a module such as pharmacodynamics, receptors, and so on. If we click on one of the modules, for instance, pharmacodynamics, it opens a window showing an overview of the module, as seen in the middle of the slide, and a series of topics underneath. And in this slide, we see therapeutic index, receptor selectivity, efficacy, and potency as some examples. If we click on the therapeutic index option, this will open another uh, page. 
And uh, here we see, in addition, some additional information with respect specifically to therapeutic index as a topic. The defining element of the PEP website are links to other content available through the Internet. So if we, uh, for example, looking at the links uh, below therapeutic index, one of those is therapeutic index simulation. And in this example, the user is taken to a website which allows them to explore changes in therapeutic in index using a simulation. The website's been available for about 10 months. It went live on April 1st, 2016, and it has seen consistent growth in terms of new sessions and new users uh, since that time. One of the goals of PEP is to provide learning resources to learners across the world, in particular to those in resource-poor countries. This map shows that PEP is reaching a worldwide audience, but more work definitely is needed to be done. Through the PEP website, we want to promote the incorporation of emerging technologies into pharmacology education, increase the value of knowledge exchange, and anticipate and support new online approaches to knowledge exchange. There are several ways you can help us in this endeavor. First, you can become engaged, uh, use the website, and encourage others to use it. Uh, the URL is listed there, www.pharmacologyeducation.org. Uh, we encourage and welcome content submissions from yourself or your colleagues or students. And the site uh, for the what URL, URL is listed there, just contribute. And certainly follow us on Twitter. I look forward to your comments and questions at the end of this webinar. Uh, my email address and is listed if you have any questions and would like to get involved. Uh, thanks for your attention now, and I'll turn it over to Lynn. Okay, so our final speaker today is uh, Lynn LeCount, and Lynn uh, is the IUFAR Administrative Officer, and she's going to be telling us about the uh, main IUFAR website. Um, before you start, Lynn, I'd just like to remind everybody, um, so Lynn will be our last speaker today. Um, there is the Q&A panel uh, at the the, the bottom, or if you open it, uh, you need to go to the top right with a question mark and press on that to open it. Um, uh, we will obviously be taking uh, your questions at the end. So um, uh, with, the, with that uh, mentioned, uh, Lynn, please, over to you. Well, thank you, Rory. Greetings from the center of the United States. My name is Lynn LeCount. I'm coming to you from the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, as you've just seen, um, there are a lot of volunteer efforts that are undertaken by pharmacologists. So as a result, I'm really a cat herder. That's my professional title. So as you've seen from the above slides, IUFAR offers many online resources and collaboration opportunities. So we felt it was critical to offer users a simple portal. But we quickly learned that there were conflicting demands for what that should offer. Here. Allow me to translate for you a little bit. So we began by polling the IUFAR Executive Committee in 2007, and then we followed up with a full stakeholder uh, poll in 2009. Ultimately, in 2011, we hired a man named Robert Fuchs, who launched the construction website. Now, you'll notice on this public portal that there are blue boxes, and each of those indicate that these are hyperlinks that take our viewers to another server, but yet these are all still IUFAR websites. Robert chose a software named Joomla. It's an open source software that was spun off of Mambo back in 05. It's used by some major commercial giants like General Electric and Lipton T. And the beauty of it is that there's a community of users who offer ongoing feedback to a nonprofit organization named Open Source Matters, and they handle the coding changes so there are no stockholders to take a piece of the profit. It all goes back into the software. So during 2012 and 2013, I trained volunteer webmasters who handle the division, the sections, and the subcommittees that you saw while Michael was describing IUFAR. Then, during 2013 and 2014, they actually uploaded and their own content, and now they maintain it. 
The portal was finally launched in July of 2015 at a cost of about 20,000 euros, but please remember that excludes the time of the webmasters and myself. Now once we go behind the firewall, you see this is the place where we start interfacing with people. Robert partnered Joomla with the JOM social module in order to obtain a database that was tailored to people fields already. Now this software offers the usual LinkedIn and Facebook kinds of tools for you know discussions, events, and announcements, but the differences these are not viewable outside of my IUFAR, and therefore they can have very candid discussions about the um, area of study and the experiments. From an administrative standpoint, the IUFAR portal is not only a collection of websites, as you saw at the first slide, it also contains many sub-websites. Although I created and I maintain about 50% of the contacts actually on iufar.org, the reality is about half of that content is really handled by our 10 volunteer webmasters. As all of you on this call already know, a database is only as good as the information that you can get out of it. And IUFAR, as you already have seen, is run by and interacts with hundreds if not thousands of volunteers. So keeping track of them is of the utmost importance. I'm going to thank Simon Maxwell for granting me permission to use his record today as an example. I want to point out to you that this is the top half of the web page. So when a user registers, we collect some basic information like what country are they in, what field of expertise, working environment, your area of specialty. Then once they've completed that process, I go in at the administrative level and I add to that volunteer's prof profile which IE farm committees that they're members of. Well, we hit a problem. Job Social lacked the ability to store more than one role. So this is the bottom half of that same screen, and here is where we see Robert's customized fields. Simon is an example of the many pharmacologists who have roles both inside and outside. So Robert created the customized fields, grouped them into four supplemental profiles, and now we can record up to four roles above and beyond the internal committees that you saw on the previous screen. So Robert then built an advanced search engine behind the firewall. Once again, you're only seeing the top half here. Now this is only available to the IUFAR executive committee members and the webmasters. So let's say Michael, our secretary general, wants to contact president of OM about the Japanese society. Well, at his convenience, he can log in and he can look up that person's name and contact information anytime he desires. The trick to it, as you already know, is that you have to keep this data current. So that's where the bottom half of this website becomes important. This is the area where I run my queries, and this is the key. I go in and I tell the computer to bring back to me all of the officers who are bringing in their terms of office are about to end. And as a result, I use this query to know which societies to contact to obtain the new contact information for their new officers. The same thing also occurs for the many committees that we have of volunteers. Again, I use this system to decide who's about to rotate off so I know who to contact to update the data. There you go. That's the key to our ever-changing rotation of volunteers. Back to you, Michael. Thank you, Lib. On behalf of Sam Enner, okay. the president of IUFAR, and uh, also Petra Turman, the uh, treasurer, I would like to thank all the present presenters. Um, and um, I'd also like to Sam, thank Sam personally as well for all his efforts in the pharmacology education project getting off the road. Uh, as you can see, it's an immense number of volunteers. And as long as they're motivated, we're prepared to take anybody. <laughs> Such as, uh, and our cats regularly contribute to some of this conference calls. Um, but one of the key things I think you've seen today 
is just an immense amount of data, an immense amount of volunteer work. And for that, you need levers on people's behavior so that they feel it's worthwhile. I think we've got a variety of thing, uh, help there on the basis that IUFAR is for the public good. It's for how to make better drugs in a difficult world, how to communicate how those drugs work simply, and uh, also to clear up scientific problems. The work and the databases that you've seen here have actually been accumulated over almost, well, almost 30 years uh, by a sm small number of subcommittees at the start. And the trick is that people need to be motivated to work publicly, but they need also to be able to make progress. And what we've been able to do is to, as science has unraveled its, its multiple complexities, to keep up with that, and expert committees have then been created. And we ensure that not only do you have the experts, the some opinion leaders in, but also they've got their enemies in the tent as well. And that means you get a, a very balanced picture. So you may not have the last paper of nature straight into one of the databases, because we require this data to be validated and to be reproduced at least once. And that is also one of the ways in which, because uh, one of the key questions that we've got in there is the data, um, how do we control IP and how we, do we control licensing? Well, the data that comes in is all data from published articles, and we require that it be reproduced independently at least once. And so there's no proprietary interactions with that. And um, Joanna, would you like to just to say a word about, um, about that in addition? Um, yes, thank you, Michael. Um, yes, that's true. All the data in the database are linked back to the primary references um, so that uh, the users can, of course, track back to the original data um, and find where that came from. Um, in addition, the database is uh, licensed under very generous um, licensing um, licenses, such as the Creative Commons Share Alike license, which really allows you to do anything you like with the data um, as long as you attribute it and share in the same manner um, under the same license. All I have to say. Thank you. And I think, also, yeah, I think also one of the crucial, crucial issues there is that we've got a combination of publications and databases. So we've got more than 100 publications, and as you've seen, with a really high H index, so that the um, authors of those get highly cited articles, and also they can get their postdocs to be on those articles, which are highly cited. And this gives them a motivation to help clear up their area and also ensure that the ligands that they're using are the best. And that's very, I think that's very, very crucial because it means that um, the data is, may not be the most um, flashy paper in nature, but it is actually data which is being reproduced and, ex and recognized by experts. What is more, because of the complexity in drug receptor interactions and in clinical use, we feel that experts are still better, the human brain is still better in terms of simplifying complexity than just data trawling by producing a massive amount of data on um, via um, going through um, the entire literature of the world. Um, Elaine had asked us, can we tell more about challenges in, in QA and QC? I think that's a very crucial issue about how we do our quality assurance. Um, Adam, do you think you want to reply about that? Uh, well, <clears throat> Michael, um, I, I think you've pretty much answered that question in, in, in your previous comments, but I can just reiterate that, that obviously we have these expert subcommittees and we regularly refer uh, back to them um, uh, you know, for, for, for updates to uh, the, the annotated data in the database. Um, and um, and w when we have uh, queries from users uh, about uh, particular data points, we will refer back to the subcommittees from this. So it's really our expert subcommittees uh, that take care, uh, take care of the quality control in the database. So that's all I have to say. Yeah but, yeah, but I would also like to thank Steve Alexander as well on the basis of being chairman of, of NCU Far Now. He's also put an immense amount of effort into putting a whole variety of metabolism data into the database, and uh, 
I think that uh, the efforts of all of the volunteers associated here is, is really crucial. It shows it's a unique human endeavor to provide simplified, validated data about critical issues in a field of great complexity. And I think that this, so we all feel quite proud to be involved in it. Um, there was another issue by Bernard um, about how, um, how we could um, mitigate uh, the negative opinions about big pharma in terms of how often, often drugs are often ignored by manufacturers being unprofitable or overpriced. One of the things that we do is we have interactions with OrphanNet, and therefore we try and have ontologies for all of the um, drug targets that are possible. That is expressed within the human genome, or, or if necessary, with, within bacteria. Um, and therefore we feel that um, the ontologies which we produce therefore encourage um, the use of uh, drugs, in particular rare diseases. And um, I think that, uh, when, therefore, we, we tend to be able to help Big Pharma as well. We have Big Pharma representatives in some of our committees. One of the, but one of the things is that uh, we're all within what remains to be, what is discussed within our committee meetings is confidential, remains so. Um, but um, ultimately, because it's validated data, nobody can actually influence us because the data has to be reproduced elsewhere. So I think that's a crucial issue whereby we can maintain our neutrality and also point out that it is a great thing to be producing drugs. Um, and um, I think that, uh, therefore, we, we are produced doing a, a, a public service. And um, I think, are there any other questions that we, we need? Um, one of the issues which I would like to bring out um, is that the, we are a database which has had multiple support over the years, initially from Pharma, but recently from Wellcome Trust, who has given us two big grants, which we're very grateful. The British Pharmacological Society has given us a long-term um, support, which, which were crucial. Aspect, the Chinese Pharmacological Society and other pharmacological societies, the Hungarian one, have, uh, have also contributed directly to the Pharmacology Education Grant. Servier have given us an unrestricted education grant for some meeting support, which we're all extremely grateful. And one of the things that we could do is that because the University of Edinburgh has supported us, we could also take on other databases which may be struggling in terms of for other societies uh, and make alliances with, with other societies. We've got an alliance with the Immunological Society for the Immunological Immunopharmacology targets and I think that this is a way forward for, um, for several people who are on this call who may wish, therefore, to get in touch with us about that. Um, and w the slides will be available on the WADAS website. And uh, they're too big to be sent. The, the slide presentations are too big in terms of size to be able to send by email. But you can get them by the WebEx system. OK, is there anything else in terms of questions? Um, did you answer the one by Elaine? Uh, so Elaine had a follow-up question. She said she uh, also has a question about the audience and users. You showed a large and expanding base. Do you have any sense of how many are clinicians in the field versus researchers? Um, I'm not sure that one was, was dealt with. Yes, yes, I agree. OK, well, we are the um, basic and clinical uh, pharmacology group, um, we have a whole variety, obviously much of the data that you've seen today is actually about drug targets, which could be thought to be about um, just basic pharmacology. But actually it's the translation of that basic pharmacology into drugs, which requires all of the clinical pharmacologists. And we, we try and take uh, wherever we can as much clinical help as we can. The clinical uh, division of our UFAR is very active. We've just set up six clinical mentoring systems whereby major universities will actually mentor groups uh, in the developing world uh, and act as training units for them. And the pharmacology education plan 
project is also very clinically oriented. And we hope that by having web-based sites, we can then get clinical and basic pharmacology into the hands of anybody with a mobile phone throughout the world. And in terms of Africa, I think that's a very great issue. Um, I mean, uh, we have Oli Inka, who's got it online, um, who wants to have our presentations, who we can interact with because he's involved in the uh, translational research in, in clinical pharmacology in Africa. And um, I think that uh, the fact of having a web-based organization is therefore a critical thing for our future and for the future of world health. Uh, we obviously require to raise funds for it, but we're a non-profit based organization. Um, okay, so there is actually one more by Elaine, but Elaine, I think you are uh, able to probably ask your questions quite easily. <laughs> and uh, uh, So probably you can talk with Michael uh, through email uh, about some of this. Uh, but I think we're already 10 minutes over time and probably we need to leave it there, unfortunately, which is a real shame because it's incredibly interesting. Um, so let me just, uh, on behalf of, uh, of the audience and on behalf of WBS, uh, thank um, Michael, Lynn, John, Adam, uh, Jamie, Joanna, Steve, and Simon for um, everything that they put into uh, producing today's presentation. Um, I'm sure you'll agree it really was a very interesting topic and a, and a, a new one for, uh, for WDS and one that we do need to uh, become more involved in. Um, and so again, thank you so much for, for everything and um, we'll, we'll make sure everything's put online um, and we'll make sure that uh, your contact details are available if you agree to that. And um, so. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much for your organization. Thank you very much. So, uh, with, with, uh, with that, uh, I'll let everybody enjoy their day, their night, their afternoon, whichever uh, point of the day you're at. So thanks everybody for, for joining as well, in the, uh, who uh, joined us in the, the uh, participants. And uh, please come and join our next uh, webinar, which, uh, WDS webinar, which will probably almost certainly be on a, a related uh, health science topic, so, and uh, we will keep you informed. Thank you.